sir. How are you? Is that your day in court or something like that? Every day. Every day? Every day. Do you really? Yeah, oh, pretty much. Yeah, at least three or four times a week, yeah. 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 Bought my first suit. Are you always in Lawrence, or? No, I bounce back and forth between Lawrence and Shawnee County, probably 50-50. Okay. And every once in a while I go, I'm the sticks, and I can get interested too. <laughs> <laughs> so what type of law do you practice? Then? I mean, it used to be a lot more criminal, but I've been, the last couple of years I've been backing away from that because this other stuff has been coming along, like guarding that light on child and care, domestic, stuff like that, and just... I was a prosecutor for a long time, so I just been kind of refreshed to go do other stuff. And I kind of feel like I've checked all the boxes I want to check on the criminal side, you know. So you're a defense counsel now? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have, a, I have a really good friend. He, Dakota Loomis. Mm -hmm. You know Dakota. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. He's he's the same way. He's Lawrence and Topeka all the time, back and forth. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was nice because I got called for jury duty. He was telling me. Case and I didn't put it together and go walk in the room and he walks in and represents his client. I'm like, thank God. Yeah, <laughs> they pick me and they're like, do you know anybody? <laughs> and Dakota's like, like, like this. And I was like, and yep. me about how case. well do you know about it? How much? You know, like, well, he was at my house on Sunday. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he's like, what role? It was like, well, our daughters are like two months apart. They're fighting for all the time. He said he was going to be in court for a while. <laughs> Hey, they said, can you be impartial? I said, I think so. Can you be impartial? I said, well, 95% sure. <laughs> and they dismissed well, me. That's my boy right there. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're going to get kicked, I'm sure. His office is like right next to mine, over in, uh, next to LBC. So. Yeah. yeah. It's usually if I... LBC, or if he's at home, he's at least his last. So. Uh, what's the, so possible? Uh, All right. Major General? Yeah. Do we know if the Major General is going to make it tonight? Okay. Uh, well, my clock shows 6.30, so I'm going to go ahead and call to order the uh, Board of Zoning Appeals first. Yeah, so before you call, roll, I'd oh. just like to introduce that we do have a new board member, yes. Bethany Falby. Welcome, um, so I'd like to welcome her to the board. And then if um, we want to go ahead and ask for a roll call, I can do that. Okay. Uh, this is the Board of Zoning Appeals meeting for Thursday, January 19th. We'll kick things off with a roll call to determine if there's a quorum. Uh, Falvey? Here. Clark? Here. Gardner? Is it right here? No? Nothing. Nope. Oh. It's Stephen. Shalinsky? Here. Here. Weisner? Here. 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 And we have four. 
Great. Um, then item on number item B, communications. Are there any communications before the board tonight? Yeah, no additional communications except uh, for the item that Caitlin has put before you, um, a little handout uh, communication I received after the packet postings. Okay. Um, is there, are there any disclosures of ex parte communications or abstentions for any of these agenda items tonight? Okay, seeing none, are there any that will be deferred tonight? Um, we did have two deferrals which um, were posted prior to the packet. Um, so those are noticed, noticed in, the, in the agenda. Great. All right, then uh, my next agenda item here is minutes. Um, to consider the approval of minutes from November 7th meeting. Are these, is this a real agenda item? It is. <laughs> <laughs> Second. Got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? And any abstentions? I abstain. Okay. All right, then let's move on to the public hearing portion. We have item number one, uh, variance for something at 722 Ash Street. We'll hear from staff. Okay, good evening everybody. Um, my name is Luke Mortensen and as Mr. Clark just noted, um, the first item tonight is a request to consider a variance from the required uh, surfacing materials for driveways and parking areas as expressed in Article 9 of the Land Development Code. The applicant seeks to utilize gravel as a driveway material in addition to three concrete parking pads and a steel perimeter edging um, for a detached dwelling under construction at 722 Ash Street. Um, a little background, the subject property was platted and recorded in 2018 as lot two of Duganville subdivision. There's a detached dwelling under construction at this time. Both the lot and the house that's being built um, have come into existence under the city's current land development code. And before I get into our five normal criteria, I'll just briefly touch on kind of an interesting component to this variance request. Um, there is a shared driveway curb cut and access easement that was established when the two lots were platted back in 2018. Um, so our property shares a curb cut and portion of the driveway with 718 Ash Street. This variance request is strictly addressing um, 722 Ash Street, um, which includes the entire easement and the, and the curb cut is off of 20, 722. Um, staff will remind the board that it approved a variance for the driveway surfacing materials for 718 Ash Street back in 2018. Uh, but the request at hand tonight should be considered totally independent of that previous variance request. Um, and I'll go ahead and get started with our five criteria. Question number one revolves around uniqueness. Um, the variance request at hand is not due to a condition based off of zoning or platting, um, and it's not totally unique to the property in question. Um, the sandy alluvial soil conditions, um, the lack of elevation change, and the shallow water table are conditions that are found across North Lawrence. Um, the subject property is encumbered by Zone X, which is an unregulated floodplain. Um, it has a 0.2% chance of annual flooding, also known as the 500-year floodplain. This um, Zone X covers virtually all of North Lawrence um, and then multiple portions of the, um, the rest of the city. Question number two concerns the rights of adjacent property owners or residents. Um, notice was provided to property owners within 400 feet of the subject property. Um, at the time that the staff report was written, we had, did not have any um, neighbor inquiries. Um, however, the property owner to the west, 718 Ash, um, has submitted some um, photos and an email, a support email, um, that we have provided to you. Um, um, there was an item yesterday and then another item today. Um, staff does not believe the granting of the driveway variance would adversely affect the rights of adjacent property owners. Um, a gravel driveway would not restrict any property from continuing to exist as a code compliant detached dwelling. Um, our third criteria involves unnecessary hardships. Um, staff does not believe requiring the applicant to install a code compliant driveway material rises to the level of unnecessary hardship 
Um, all new driveways outside of the FEMA designated zones, flood zones A, AE, and AH are held to the standards um, expressed in Article 9 of the code. Staff is aware that the ground conditions in North Lawrence and the of the ground conditions in North Lawrence, um, and the code and is aware of that too. Um, it lays out design options for surfacing materials that would be more permeable than traditional concrete or asphalt driveways. Um, our building safety division actually just reviewed and approved um, a detached dwelling that is using concrete strips with the grass median. Um, that would be a code compliant parking material and it would also allow for some groundwater infiltration. Um, and I'm going to jump out of my um, notes a little bit, but we've talked about this in past meetings. The code also takes into consideration pervious and impervious um, percentages in our density and dimensional standards. So it already thinks about what zoning district you're in, and it, it um, has a stated maximum building cover of maximum impervious surface. So the code and, and, and staff are thinking about that when we review our um, applications. Mm. Gravel driveways are not, only, are not the only or the most efficient option for reducing stormwater flooding events. Um, in fact, when layers of gravel and underlying soil, soil are continually compacted by vehicles, um, its capacity to absorb stormwater and facilitate infiltration can be reduced depending on maintenance and, and upkeep. Um, criteria number four talks about adverse effects. Um, staff believes granting this variance may adversely affect the public health, safety, morals, order, convenience, prosperity, and general welfare. Um, our municipal services and operations staff have indicated in discussions that loose gravel can and does end up in the road right of way. Um, it can and does cause damage to vehicles when it's kicked up you know, at, at vehicle speed um, as, as flying debris. Um, it can and does also sometimes settle in exposed and underground stormwater sewage systems or stormwater drainage systems, um, and it can sometimes create a layer of sediment, and, and that can reduce the capacity and efficiency of those systems. Finally, um, it's been noted that during dry or windy conditions, um, neighborhoods that have large quantities of these gravel driveways, um, there can be um, dust that settles on structures and vehicles across property lines. So the final criteria um, concerns the spirit and intent of the code. Um, staff concluded that approving the variance request would be opposed to the spirit and intent of the land development code. Um, Article 9 regulates parking, loading, and access areas. Um, its stated purpose is to create safe parking areas that do not adversely affect surrounding properties and land uses while allowing for flexibility based on different environmental conditions. So the code intends to find that balance between environmental conditions and a safe and efficient transportation system of which driveways and parking areas are a part. Um, at this time, the code recognizes that and it permits gravel as an option for those that are in the, in the FEMA map regulatory floodplain. Um, and then there are various previous options for those that are, are not in that regulatory floodplain. Planning staff are drafting um, a number of amendments to the existing parking article um, of the code, and, and one of those proposed amendments is removing gravel as a permitted driveway material in all um, areas of the city. And it would be replaced with additional pervious options, such as pervious concrete, um, like we talked about those concrete strips and grass medians. This is um, a potential, if it's adopted by the um, city commission, that would be an amendment to our, to our code. To wrap up, um, staff could not conclude that the proposed variance met all five criteria and recommends the board deny the variance to use gravel as a driveway surfacing material for the property address at 722 Ash Street. Um, some reps of the applicant are here tonight, and I'll just say they've been really great applicants, um, really helpful at answering questions and um, engaged in the process. So I can stand for questions, otherwise the applicant is here tonight. This, this is, has a shared easement with yep. 718? Yep, and I'm gonna, I actually have a document that shows where that easement is located. And I'm gonna turn on the... Mm 
we're on. Are we having technical difficulties? I just heard on YouTube and can't see it here in the room. Okay, I'll, I might bring it up. There it is. So this is a copy of the replat that was done back in 2018. Lot two, oops, sorry. This is the subject property. This is Ash Street. This 20 by 35 foot square is where the two driveways come together. They were given a variance in 2018. This is what we're talking about tonight. Cool. That's, I see that in the, it's in your staff report on page six as well. Yeah. Um, the variance that was granted to 718, how, how is the variance handled when it is across an easement? So that variance was for only um, that property. I think in the minutes, it's noted that 722, at the time of development, if they chose to have a gravel driveway, would have to come in and seek their own variance. So that's how we got to tonight. Okay. But if this variance is denied, it would be a, a gravel meets concrete point. Somewhere outside the easement? It would be um, where 718 meets the easement along the property line. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, at this time, we'd like to hear from the applicant. Hi, this is Nora and Leah. We're with Studio 804 requesting the application. Um, we're requesting a gravel drive for our residents as we believe it will assimilate our design with the five adjacent um, neighbors that are next to our property. Um, we believe that this design for a gravel drive will assimilate us um, with these five residences um, in the 700 block. There are also a total of 14 um, residences with gravel drives on the 700 block. Um, and we also believe that this design will better assimilate us to our neighbors at 718 Ash Street um, as our, we share a driveway in the shared easement. Um, we also believe that the proposed gravel drive and existing apron reduces the amount of particulates that could possibly get into the storm system uh, as opposed to a traditional concrete drive. Another thing is we are going for lead platinum for our building, so sustainability is something that's really important to us. And we believe that a gravel driveway will be more permeable, thus more sustainable, kind of following our building desire. Thank you. Anything else? Do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? Um, yeah, I have a question. The uh, code, at least for certain flood areas, maybe not this one, envisions uh, allowing gravel with uh, concrete edge, and you're proposing a metal edge? Yeah, we're proposing, so it would be similar to what is at 718 Ash Street, so we're proposing between four to seven inch uh, metal edging along the concrete or along the gravel now when you say four to seven inches that's um that's vertical, vertical or horizontal edging. that's the vertical edging that would hold the gravel back okay. from being thrown around other sites thank you mm -hmm. and that matches what's next door yeah um, I, i'd like to hear a little bit more about um why you why the research in um it having more more particles go into the water versus concrete so the way that the we're thinking that we know that the city is concerned with gravel getting into the stormwater system and we also want to match what our neighbors have so we're thinking that the concrete um, apron and the steel edging that's along the side would prevent any more gravel com from coming into the concrete or from coming into the stormwater system so we want to match what our neighbors have. And we think that, of course, as you guys kind of asked just now, it would look awkward to have a concrete drive and then gravel and then a concrete apron. So in order to match that, we believe our design is the best 
uh, to not only match our neighbors, but also to prevent anything else from getting into the stormwater system. And then we are also, as it's stated in the uh, application, providing a concrete, 485 square feet of concrete pads for uh, parking the car. If you go to page uh, four, you can see the pads and the, um, the diagram of the steel edging and everything as well. Was that sufficient? I still didn't understand what, um, I, I think I didn't, the part of the question that I, so why do you, you had mentioned in your original statement that you felt like the this gravel that you're proposing is less, you know, would be less sediment or whatever going into the sewer system than, um, than concrete would be, and is there, uh, is there did you have, that? yeah. No, I guess what I'm trying to say is we think that in order to match what our, I don't think, I think less might, might have been the wrong word. Um, as far as trying to match what our neighbors have in their design and then for our design, um, what would be best for not only just allowing our, our site to be more permeable, see if we have um, concrete, if we use a concrete driveway, we'll have 32% of the site be impervious. But if it's gravel, it'll only be 19%. And so we understand that there's a possibility that gravel, like we understand the city's concern about gravel getting in, um, but we just believe this design would be best to assimilate our house to the neighbors. But as far as proof of that, I think less is the wrong word. It's just the best design for what is given on site now. Oh, also kind of piggybacking off of that, um, like you said, there's 32% that would then be impervious, and then you'd have all that water running off going through the already established shared easement. So you would end up kind of having more of like a, like more gravel would then go from our concrete through our gravel onto the street as opposed to it being gravel throughout the whole thing. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but I want to get your opinion. Okay. You, even though we're not in a floodplain per se, right. is flooding a concern at this property with, let's just say, a significant rain event? So our site does, um, towards the south, it's a foot higher, and then towards the north, where, the, where it meets Ash Street, is a foot lower. So um, having water there um, would be, so the water would meet the concrete apron and so then that would allow less water to pool in front of our site. But from what we've seen being on construction site um, next to 718 since September, we haven't had any issues with water pooling or any sort of uh, flood issues in our site. So you guys have only been there since September? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I have a question. Um, have you guys looked into any of the other options for surfacing? I've noticed that there was asphalt for that. We have not looked at the asphalt option. Um, we've noticed that in past projects that this um, uh, non-for-profit has done, um, ha they've done concrete pads for strips for your tires to run along. And we've just noticed that people who tend to buy the house have a hard time. like following the concrete pad. So another reason that gravel would be best is not only does it fit our design, but it also would be easier for the user to drive along. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we will open up the public portion of the of the agenda item. Hi everybody, I'm uh, Steve Evans and I'm the owner of the property at 718 Ash, uh, just to the west and adjacent to 722 Ash. And Luke, I know I got my photographs in kind of late. Were they able to see the photographs? Yes. Well done. Yeah. Um, particularly the ones from Ash Street that show 
the apron and the easement area and then the drive. Were those from yesterday or today? Pardon me? Were those from yesterday or today? Today. So th those would have been the paper copies that, yeah, that you're looking at. Okay. Well, I would suggest that the photographs tell more of the story about what's going on here than the site plan and the, and the subdivision plans. And um, we have, um, I was here in October of 2018 with our builder and the person who was thinking about building and buying 722 and um, uh, at the time, um, you know, we went through all of the same great <laughs> criteria that, that Leah and Nora went through, but um, we did go through in pretty great detail um, the sustainability aspects of this and the fact that we really did want a shared easement in an older property um, where there was one drive going into an old property and it really didn't make a whole lot of sense to spend the money and create the topographical uh, challenges to have two different drives into two different properties. So the shared easement made a whole lot of sense to us for a lot of reasons. But um, in 2018, um, really not a heck of a lot has changed since 2018 in October to now in terms of why we think this is a good idea. And uh, I guess I could say in summary that we obviously support the variance um, for our new neighbors. And, um, and, you know, that's the primary thing I want to say here. Um, I won't go into, you know, the detail, the sustainability aspects that have been covered quite well here. And I think really when you look at pervious services in Lawrence, there's probably some arguments about it may not be appropriate for commercial projects, but I think if you scale it down and look at more residential, more smaller scale projects, it seems to make a whole lot of sense. And um, the good news is we've lived here for a year and a half, so we're not guessing about how this works and how it functions. I can report to you what we've experienced since October of 2018. Um, the, um, the material, there is an argument for the material migrating onto Ash Street, onto any street, into our properties. And I did send some photographs with details of the steel edging, and, and it really works. It, um, you, there's several details, um, uh, several properties on Walnut, um, particularly on Walnut Street that use this very same detail. And that's been in place for several years. I assume that those properties got a variance, but I really don't know. Some of those were built back in, uh, you know, 10, 12 years ago. But with the concrete apron on Ash Street, there's very little, very minimal migration of the pea gravel. And keep in mind, this is pea gravel. These are little tiny little pieces of gravel. It's not sand. And um, it's got an underlayment of a road material that allows it to be compacted, but still pervious. And um, I think in you know the 15 months we've lived there, I've gone out a couple of times and either swept the pea gravel off the apron, not off of Ash Street, because if you get a rain or if you get a snow or something, it, you know, nature cleans it up for you. But um, as far as our property goes, the pea gravel has not migrated onto our yard, onto our landscape material, or onto Ash Street in any measurable, you know, maintenance related issue. Um, and I, I, you know, I read this in the last few days, the staff report, um, Luke, correct me if I don't have this right, but um, the recorded easement requires materials to be consistent between 722, 718 and the shared easement. 
Now that's a little different than what you presented. Um, the, the, there's no requirement that the materials be the same. The, the variance is talking about the entirety of the easement. Because okay. the easement is totally located on this, this subject property. Okay. Yeah. Well, now what? The easement is located. It's a shared easement. It's a shared easement, but but the so it's the not located on either property. It, what? It's not located on either property. It's located on both properties. No, it's not. This is the document. the 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 recorded easement, the twenty by thirty five foot right. space, is on lot two. Mm -hmm. On the subject property. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. In terms of the plan orientation. In terms of the lot, you know, the land records okay. and how the register. Of okay. It. Nonetheless, it's a shared easement. Correct. With maintenance responsibilities, so it could be located really anywhere in that area, and be a shared easement. But it's recorded in this location. I got it. Got it. Fine. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I think I, I would consider it a hardship if. You know, for us, and I've always had a little trouble kind of getting my arms around that word hardship <laughs> in your criteria. Um, and, and you all helped me a year and a half ago when I was here trying to kind of figure that out. But um, honestly, for us, if, if the easement was required to be changed, that would be a hardship for us in many ways. Um, in terms of the design and the geomet geometry of configuring whatever, if it were concrete ribbons or concrete um, sides, it would be rather difficult to, to design something that would work well for both properties. It can be done, but I think it would be, um, it would be a really awkward way to enter the properties. So um, I think for me, it would really be a hardship for us to have to deal with that at this stage in the game. Um, and really, I mean, we pointed this out before, and Leonora did too, gravel driveways are more reflective of the existing conditions in North Lawrence than any other kind of material, be it concrete or asphalt or, or dirt uh, in some cases. So I think in terms of the, the, the character of the neighborhood, this is a whole lot more appropriate than concrete driveways um, at the end of the day. And I think that's, that's a pretty big deal. Um, we could talk a long time about the sustainability and the permeability of this material. We've been there for a year and a half, and the areas that we've driven on are pretty solid. They're easy to maintain, they're easy to drive on, they're easy to walk on, and we've experienced no ponding at all. So the material maintains its perviosity, if that's a word, um, but it, it works beautifully, and uh, it's a whole lot nicer to look at than concrete or asphalt um, at the end of the day. Um, you all did have some questions about ponding and pooling. Um, some of the photographs I sent Luke this morning showed, or actually yesterday, was part of the package yesterday, showed the conditions on Ash Street after rain events, and we had a bunch of them last year. And there are, you um, know, I, I don't even think I got the most dramatic photographs where some of the ponding and runoff from the properties on Ash Street the pond actually goes to the median and sometimes goes over the crown of the street. And that is a hazard <laughs> for everybody that lives there and everybody that drives there. And a solution of gravel and a pervious material really benefits those circumstances. Um, and I think that would be true all along Ash Street, and it certainly is on our properties. I mean, you guys have seen the, the pooling and ponding out there, you know, after a rain now, and it's, uh, you know, it's hard because of the sight lines coming out of our driveway. It's sometimes kind of difficult to see the traffic that's coming. It's a 22-foot-wide street. Um, 
It's a little residential one block uh, road, but um, I think um, that's certainly something to be considered. And in my perspective is it's a hardship for us and it's a hardship for the city to have to try to maintain a ponding and a pooling condition. And what we're proposing would help alleviate that problem on Ash Street. Um, lastly, uh, the original design idea for these two lots that have been subdivided uh, was that they would be planned coherently, that we would use similar landscape materials and hardscape materials, we would have a shared driveway, we'd have good neighbors, you know, that um, um, hopefully people that looked into our site would see, well, gee, this was planned really well. And uh, it's pleasing to look at and it functions well. And what the Studio 804 folks have come up with has just made it even better. Um, and I'd really, uh, I'd really uh, encourage you to think um, in, in this context about approving this variance. So it um, would really, really make our lives a whole lot easier and I think would be the right solution. So that's all I have. If you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Please leave. You've touched on some things that I'm interested in. And I think I was here for, for you when you were here in October. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. I think I was. I think I remember you. But, um, so you've been there for, what, 15 months now? You said. Right. And so you've gotten to live even through that rainy season we had last winter through spring. Is that right? Yeah. And so would you think that was a pretty good test run of the, the permeability of this driveway and... and how it reacts to big rain events. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is it your experience that this neighborhood and the neighborhood around it has issues with water pooling and water runoff issues during rain events? Yes. Okay. Is it your opinion that your Per the permeability of your driveway is preventing a lot of water from joining the rest of the runoff on the street? Oh, yeah. Let's I mean, imagine a hypothetical. What if, what if your driveway and this driveway here at 722, what's, let's imagine they're all concrete. Would that cause more water to join the water that's already pooling and running down ash? Yeah, we... Hey, let, um, me, let me, we'll okay, get there. Okay, go ahead. And I, I don't, I think I remember was there an issue of, of a pump failing in North Lawrence this last summer or spring during one of these rain events? I think the issue um, with the pump in North Lawrence is a bigger scale issue. But I'm just and saying, I was there a pump that, that yes. failed in Lawrence? Yes. The answer to your pump, question is yes. And was that pump, that pump was specifically there to help get rid of runoff and storm water and stuff like that? Throughout the entire neighborhood. Okay. Yeah. Um, so... You've been there long enough to see your driveway at 718 through a pretty wet spring, right? Yep. And it's your opinion that having that permeable driveway there to try to, to soak up some of that water, I mean, probably help the rest of the neighborhood as far as not adding to pooling and runoff that's already occurring in that area. Is that right? Well, and that's my experience. That's not my opinion. Okay. Thank you. Sure. If I could answer your question, too, this apron is at a high point um, on Ash Street. We didn't require a culvert <coughs> underneath the apron. So it's a high point, and water, our, ha our lot is graded to drain to the north and the south, as yours will be at the end of the day. So with a concrete drive, absolutely you'll get a lot of water running out to that high point and dispersing both, both to the east and the west in that, in that ditch. So it, there'll be a lot more. And I don't think we saw any ponding on our driveway during all of those rain events. And I can tell you that 
when we were under construction, there was water running everywhere. <laughs> it, uh, and now with that permeability, it slows everything down and lets it kind of soak in. Um, so our experience has been very positive. Any other questions for public comment? All right, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, anybody have any questions for staff or for the applicant before we begin discussion? Can I ask staff? Yeah. I think you kind of see where my questions are coming. You probably heard what I was asking Mr. Evans. It seems like we have a plan in our code, you know, what we want people building their driveways out of and and whatnot, and then what we want to do with the water that's going to run off of that driveway. And I think you even speak to that a little bit in the staff report. But, so here's the question, just kind of set me on, on the right path. It seems like we have an issue where North Lawrence is fighting our plan, or we have a low-lying area, lots of water, some flooding issues, and it seems like even though these permeable driveways, at least as set forth like here in this application, are you know, not, they're not favored by our code, it seems like they are in fact you know, helping us in the struggle that we have in that area where it's just every time we have an applicant come in here or you know, and other things that I do in the community, when I'm talking to somebody from North Lawrence, they really are keenly aware of the water, standing water, cooling water, running water issue there. And it just seems like anything we can do to try to take strain off of this system where we're dealing with failing pumps and then auxiliary pumps don't kick in and, and stuff like that, it just it can't be bad in the larger scheme of things. Mm -hmm. So there, now I, I toss it to you. I took some notes. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, um, I don't think Catherine and I can speak to the pump, a pump failure or a pump did not fail. Uh, I'm not aware of anything, and if I was, again, I don't have the expertise to discuss that. I do know the pump failed, or there was a failure at the pump, but I don't know the extent of what caused the failure, so we can't speak to that part. Uh, but, and, I, and I'd like to address um, kind of some of what you talked about, about other gravel drives in North Lawrence. I um, printed off this scary looking old text. <laughs> this is from our 49 zoning code. And I have also printed off um, our paving standards from our 66 zoning code. So that was the last zoning code before our current one. And the oldest code didn't address gravel. It didn't even address materials. It just addressed where you could park your car. That obviously it was a different time. Under the 66 code, they don't address gravel as a permitted material at all. They don't consider the floodplain. It wasn't a permitted driveway material. So when you see so many gravel drives up in North Lawrence, that's a result of just the time of construction. Um, at that time, they weren't looking at the material of the driveway. That doesn't mean that they're grandfathered. We don't really use that term. They're kind of just existing non-conformities, nonconformity, non they're, they're an existing condition that if the site was scraped, they'd be required to come into compliance. I took a brief look at some of the past recent variances we've done for the same thing. We've done some on Elm, we've done some on Ash, some on Locust, some on Lion. So they've come and we've recommended approval and we've recommended denial. So we really are thinking about it. And we really are thinking about some of the conditions that you just addressed. And, and, and to hit it home, and, and you're not going to like this point, is it goes back to what this board does. Yeah. And this board doesn't get to make code. It doesn't get to think what's, what could be better and what we think might align with the city's goals a little bit better. Unfortunately, that's, you know, other commissions and other boards. We have to really look at what the code does allow and what it doesn't allow. 
And, and um, yeah, if you would. Yeah, so one other thing, too, to keep in mind uh, with North Lawrence is as, as the city has, over time, made infrastructure improvements, um, and since the levy has gone in, those FEMA maps have adjusted over time. So in the past, much more of North Lawrence was in the regulatory floodplain than it is now. So as those types of things are evolving, the city code is also, North Lawrence is kind of slow to come up to um, where our current code standards might be just because the existing conditions at a time prior to these codes have taken it, have different water uh, requirements, floodplain requirements, different areas were in the floodplain that maybe are not in the floodplain anymore. So that might be why it seems like um, North Lawrence has a um, large proportion of gravel in areas that typically would not be designed as gravel for driveways and parking areas. And as, as those things evolve, the code has tried to evolve as well to take those things into consideration. Um, and so that's just something to think about. North Lawrence is a little unique in that regard, um, whereas other parts of the city may not be. So. I think it just, I'm not really refuting anything you're saying. I'm just saying, I think we would all agree, though, that it is an area that's also unique in that it's, I think it's uniquely vulnerable to standing water in that area. Um, and it's something that we, I think we just keep hearing over and over when people come in here. Some that they're, they just, they're, they always seem to keep a weather eye on those on those events. Okay. Uh, then I have a question for staff. Yeah. Um, they keep talking that concrete or asphalt would be their only option, um, but the next uh, number two, page two of the staff report, talks about grid unit pavers with grass or concrete brick or clay. Those would be permeable options that would be allowed by code. That's correct. Okay. Can you speak to when that was added to the code? Uh, well, it was. This is part of the 2000 and when this my current land development code was adopted in 2006. Okay. So it's all part of that same code. And I, and I would say the 1966 code also has the same grid unit pavers that that type of uh, material. Okay. Luke, when you were presenting, um, I, I heard something that sounded like there had been new additions to the code to address this in what sounded more recent times. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So not yet. Um, uh, our planner, Mary Miller, she's kind of spearheading some um, amendments to the overall parking, um, the Article 9, which is our parking um, chapter of the Land Development Code. And one of, of you know, a couple amendments would address gravel. It would, as it's proposed, would no longer be permitted in anywhere in the city, even in regulatory floodplain. As part of that, additional, more pervious options would be created. So I talked about those concrete strips with the grass median. We've seen that come along a little bit recently. Um, and then additionally, they were gonna be adding um, porous and pervious pavement options as well. Thank you. All right. Let's and, and I just want to say that has not been approved by any commissions or anything. That's right. So it's just a plan that staff is. It's at the staff level. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I'd say let's let's start a discussion here. We can always ask staff if we have any questions. Um, thoughts, feelings. Yeah. Um, I'd like to address the uniqueness question. I think that um, North Lawrence overall is unique in the city as a whole uh, because of their uh, drainage issues. I also think that this area is perhaps unique within North Lawrence. Um, as I always do, um, I went out and looked at the site. <coughs> that block is full of gravel driveways. Moreover, what I found quite interesting 
is that Ash Street has a 600 block as well as a 700 block and the entire 600 block street is gravel mm -hmm. and I think it is a little bizarre that we're telling people that they can't have a gravel driveway when the city has not even upgraded a city street to um, a standard pavement right there, like half a block away. Um, so I think that is a very unique factor. And uh, I, I really have no problem with um, the first condition being met by these applicants. As a, as a point of clarification, I'm looking at the city GIS, and I'm, I am curious. I, there are houses with 600 ash addresses, but there's no there's no city right away there or anything like that. Um, it's an interesting point. Yeah. So uh, I believe that's. They get, I would have to do some research. We would have to do some research on that, but it appears that it potentially was uh, vacated at some point um, and did not go all the way through. So it was not developed as a city street, mm -hmm. even though they have a 600 address. Um, it would require a little research into the development of the property of the city. Oh, yeah. no, that's fine. Regardless, it is an existing condition. <laughs> All right, if anybody has any general thoughts. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, so let's just, we'll tackle these one at a time. Um, give me a second. Got to. Uh, number one, variance require, uh, variance request arises from such conditions that are unique to the property. Does anybody have any trouble getting around that one? Uh, that granting the variance would not adversely affect the rights of adjacent property owners. Number two. The, the property owner that would be most impacted is here tonight and indicated he support this variance request, so I'm inclined to say that I can get around number two as well. Staff agreed that yeah. it would not. Nobody else. Okay, I'm going to skip number three. We're going to go down to number four, that the variance desired would not adversely affect the public health, safety, and morales, order, convenience, general welf welfare. I, I respect staff's opinion, but I actually, I, I reviewed the last time we discussed this, and I know we know there's not precedent, but the, the last time it was discussed, I think that what was brought up in testimony based on um, observations of conditions um, specifically on that street, I actually believe you used to live on that street as well, that the, the bigger concern was not the gravel making its way into the, the waterways, it was the, if the, the more surfaces that were impermeable, the more water, the more runoff that would be created was a much greater hazard. So with respect to number four, I would also say that I am good with the variance because I think it actually probably not only does it not adversely impact public health and safety, it may, may be better for public health and safety. And I, I also appreciate, you, you had some comments that I really appreciated talking about how like the stormwater engineers have thought through this stuff. They've thought about the runoff. They've thought about what's happening inside the, the storm sewers, what's happening with gravel getting out onto the streets and stuff like that. Um, and, and that is why it's a little bit different than the um, 2018 variants. Those conversations were had for this one. Right. Yeah. Um, and I just, the, the, 
I don't know if you can pull it up there, but the the city storm sewers on the on the GIS map. Oh, it looked it. There wasn't like a continuous storm sewer I, when I pulled it up. Just maybe a few drainage canals and an. It's it's in um, it's an open. It's the ditch style, the exposed ditch. Um, and even even with that, it didn't make it all the way across. Like it's, even at their properties, it like yeah, petered I, out. I was I, I did a site visit the other day, and and it the. GIS graphic, which is the hashed green color, it doesn't extend here. In real life, the ditch comes and goes. You know, it's a it's a North Lawrence exposed drainage ditch. Yeah. And then when you're dealing, it's been my experience where you're dealing with an exposed draining ditch, even though now we might do things like pave the ditch <coughs> or you know cover it, make it you know whatever tunnel, but just <coughs> exposed dish that goes back to it's permeable that's the whole thing it's it's permeable and it's, it, it has value and that's why they used it for you know the the first 200 years of the republic is because they work <laughs> you know the water runs and but the water is also going into the ground as it's running through there so yeah unfortunately i don't think the water in these ditches run would you agree <laughs> with that statement Stephen? like yeah, the problem with with the ditches is Culverts have all collapsed. Yeah. Along the driveways, and they're a million years old. Right. Yeah. So the water is contained within the culverts that have taken. Yeah. So really, at the end of the day, um, the, the entire ditch should probably be prepared. Yeah. And we talked in that bottom about eventually, you know, get, getting that. It's, and when we talk about code compliant driveway, apron, and curb cut, Part of that is the analysis of, is a culvert required? In this case, it sounds like it wasn't, but that's one thing they do address when they do those concrete aprons is get those tunnel culverts in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, any other thoughts on number four from the board? Okay, go to number five, um, that granting the variance would not be opposed to the general spirit and intent of the code. Uh, any thoughts? No? Okay, we're going to return to number three here. Uh, that the strict application of the provisions would constitute an, unnecess an unnecessary hardship upon the property owner represented at the application. I think there's some other pervious options that they have that are allowed by code, so I don't think it's one or the other, like they're presenting it. So I'm going to be not supporting the variance because I think they have some other options. Yeah, and that's, that's well taken. I would, I would simply say would, if you look at it big picture, allowing this permeable driveway it's going to help mitigate water pooling and running on the street, which is going to be good for the applicant. Because it just it makes it just makes travel in the area safer. It just will. I know that the city envisions fighting this pooling water issue a little differently, but I don't know that, that it's quite happened yet. I think it could be a hardship in that there is a shared easement which is already approved as gravel and to um, use some other option for the remainder of their driveway. Um, could be awkward from a design point of view. 
That's the that's the Historic Resources Commission, not the Board of Zoning Appeals. Just kidding. Well, I don't Just think joke. this is historic, <laughs> no. but it is it is a hardship question. So two points: uh, the um, the easement area was not part of the 2018 variance, and so because it's gravel today, is more of a result of the applicant needed a way to get to the driveway. Mm -hmm. And we had discussed back then, we knew this would be coming down the pike, and so it was understood that it wouldn't go to concrete without having this variance go first. Mm -hmm. And I just will remind everybody, the definition of unnecessary hardship really relies on the fact that the applicant can't use that property for a code compliant use anymore. Yeah. I guess I'll just say that I, I'm okay with granting a variance due to unnecessary hardship just because I haven't been presented with evidence that there's another um, surface that will mitigate any flooding concerns in this area, which I think are, are you know, whether or not it's in a floodplain, there's enough evidence to support that flooding is a major issue. and gravels proved to be something that is permeable and I haven't seen anything to support another surface that is uh, conforming that can be used. Oh goodness, so. yeah, do we, is there, is there anything this, that we can address that, like rough permeability coefficients for these various things? Well, when an applicant submits an application, they can certainly submit specs for their proposed material. But. Yeah. That was not presented in the application. Well, I think my, my general feelings right now is I'm, I'm just uncomfortable with this. Uh, mostly just because I know, I, I remember a year and a half ago when the applicant at 718 came and there was this idea of like cohesive and we thought we'd see you a month or two later and, and we'd roll this around. Um, I personally have a gravel variance on my driveway in North Lawrence that was granted in this room. Um, and I feel like historically Again, not that we get to set precedents or anything like that, but North Lawrence has always been this kind of exception to the rule and that we were trying to use this variance process as a way to grant some alleviation of the flooding in, in North Lawrence. Um, and yet in the light of the our roles and what's going on that seems to maybe have been an abuse of that power in the past. Um, and we're now stuck in a position where a variance that was made eight, 15 months ago or something like that would not be granted, being it they're literally right next to each other in the same part of town, um, you know, neighbors, and in what is a, what I consider both beautiful, two very great additions to the North Lawrence neighborhood. Um, so. Those are my thoughts. Uh, I don't enjoy being in this position and might simply abstain from the vote at this point. I would, I would simply say, and maybe this is some explanation to staff who, who've had to wrestle with me for the last year and a half or whatnot, but maybe I'm particularly poorly suited to this job because, you know, I'm an attorney and I would say this, my short explanation of what attorneys do is they dwell where the gray is mm -hmm. because where you have bright lines, everybody knows where they are and everybody knows what they're supposed to do. 
but where lawyers get involved, it's because there's some exception or something that's different that causes the bright lines not to work. And so that's the world that I live in day I'm, to day, you know? Kevin, to speak in just a minute, but I would just remind you all of the presentation that we watched a few months ago. This process is alleviating situations where a property can't be used for that use. True, but the thing is, is these five points for analysis, they are inherently subjective. They are. Mm -hmm. And so your, your admonitions are, are well taken every time, and I listen to you every time. But as I look through here, you know, I can look at these points where there's disagreement between, say, myself and staff, and I can look at this and I can, I can make the argument to myself, yeah, I, I see where the exception is. I was just going to address um, just a reminder. Once the item has begun, you, uh, a commissioner or board member cannot abstain from the vote. Oh. That has to be done at the beginning prior to any items. If you feel you have to recuse, that would be when that would take place. So once the item is in process, you can't actually abstain. Thank you. I did not know that. I thought that was a, a viable. But you can abstain from other things as well, correct? Well, you can abstain from voting for, say, like minutes. If you were not present um, during the time when the minutes were, uh, or when the meeting was, that, that's something where you, you, you actually can't vote on that because you didn't, you weren't there, you don't know if the minutes are accurate. Um, so you yep. could abstain from that because you don't have relevant knowledge. Or whether there's a conflict of yeah. interest. For example, you own the property or some other reason like that, you would need to abstain. But typically that happens ahead of time. Under the bylaws, if you, unless you have some type of conflict or you weren't at the meeting, then we have to vote. Yeah, and the responsibility is to vote. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Didn't know that. Will somebody now just make a motion? I think, and we'll figure out where the votes are. I've heard at least two. Are you sorry? Was that was that? Are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> You're better at it than me, aren't you? <laughs> I'll, 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 if the chair is okay with it, I will make a motion. Make a motion was likely the most interesting vote we've had here in a while. I don't know about that, but um, I would move that. Um, we approve the variance request to allow the applicant to use gravel for the residential driveway surface. Um, instead of the pavement surface standards identified in section 20-913E of the land development code um, due to it meeting all five of the criteria for a variance. I will second that. All right, we got a motion and a second. We're going to vote. Would you like a show of hands? Yes, please. This time. All right. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed? All right. Motion carries. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you guys so much. The house is beautiful. I take a picture of it every morning. So. Okay. I'll just be the creepy guy take a picture of it every morning. <laughs> I mean, they do back to the levy, so I'm sure they, they have way creepier things. Okay. Um, I don't see any other agenda items, and our training is not part of. Yes. Is, so okay. We, but it's not part of this meeting, correct? It was. So oh, okay. our annual coma training was scheduled for this meeting, but. Um, yeah. I have to go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so we will be probably moving that to February. Okay. Thank you, Randy. Uh, then I would take a motion to adjourn the Board of Appeals. So moved. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And we do not have a sign code this evening because Correct. it was deferred as well. And just for FYI, we may not have any. Um, if the appeal and sign code come back for February, you might have uh, those items for February otherwise. 
nothing. That's all we have so far on the agenda. We'll know more tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. yeah. 3 p.m. Is there any way just, I mean, instead of letting us know like four days a week prior that if, if is there any way like to bump that up? I mean, I know there's the appeals. So what do you, you mean, may not, like, if they decide to defer to? You, this may not be the best example, but if there's no appeals pending and it hits the next day and nothing happens, is there a way to give us more than like? Oh, I see what you're saying. A four before, or five like, days notice yeah. that there's so not like going to be a meeting. If there's not going to be a meeting, yeah. yes, we can we can definitely let you know if we don't have anything on the agenda. We probably won't know about the appeal until it gets closer to the meeting. I understand this but, is a unique situation, yes. but th that's not very frequently. Yes. We don't we don't usually have appeals pending. Correct. So. Okay. But yes, in those instances, we can, if we know definitively there is not going to be a meeting, we can let you know as soon as possible. That'd be awesome. Right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. And we do, we're, we're going back to our first Thursday of the month now. Yep. This was just an anomaly meeting schedule, so. Okay. We have two anomaly meetings this year, though, right? July, yes. too? Yeah, the yeah. Uh, yes. So. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to the board, Jennifer. Thank you.